My name is John Upa. I work with Quest TV Africa. Um, Quest TV Africa happens to be the premier 24-hour fashion channel on African fashion. Koseba is a brand that specializes in couture, bridal and evening wear. Um, it's based in the UK and we've been in um, operation since 1991. Uh, the name Koseba is a derivation of my mother's name because she was very supportive of me when I was young and going into fashion, which is what enabled me to start my business at a very young age because I had the full support of my parents. And um, so that basically is what Koseba is. I grew up within the campus of University of Ibadan. My father was a professor at uh, the University College Hospital, so we had accommodation within the campus. So I went to nursery school, I went to senior staff school, I went to international school Ibadan, and then I went to University of Ife to study fine art. That was a compromise I made with my parents. They thought, they said you can do whatever you want to do, do it to the best of your ability. But they thought going to university is really important. Apart from what you're studying, it just helps you to get um, form, lateral thinking, it helps you to grow, it helps you to mature, and it's just a good, it's, it's a good thing to have as a degree. But there wasn't a university doing fashion at that time. So I said, okay, I'll do fine art, specialise in textiles, which can help me with my fashion, and then go on to do fashion afterwards. So I had a totally sort of normal Nigerian background, but I was just blessed with forward-thinking parents, because now, just like with football, I'm sure when I was young, when people are playing football, their parents would send them inside to go and study. Now, if a, if a parent sees a child playing football, they'll be like, oh my God, please let him be like David Beckham. It's the same thing with design now. I think it's now more accepted, but back then, not so much. African fashion has always been looked at as um, something that is a bit of an, a, a bit of something that people don't understand. But now with media, people have, are managing to understand what, it is, what it's about. And then you find that it, it's not individualistic. It's not an individual thing. It, 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 it's like a group kind of thing. But right now, with the way that media has been involved in it, people have managed to be able to carve a niche for themselves in the industry. The, the designers are doing good. The models are doing good. The makeup industry is, is coming to its own as well. The, the hair industry is coming to its own as well. So collectively, I think different aspects of, of, um, of the industry have contributed in making the industry what it is at the moment. From the age of about six, seven, I realized that I could draw very well. I had, a, I had a great talent for drawing and, you know, my parents were very social. They'd go to weddings and would come back from the weddings and I would draw the whole bridal train, what they wore with great detail. And at that time, I was just doing something that I found fascinating. As I grew older, I now started adding things for my imagination for the people to wear. And obviously that was design but you know we didn't have a machine in the house my dad was a professor my mom was a nurse you know came from a quite an academic uh, background um, but by the time I got to maybe 15 16 where you have to decide what you're going to do if you're going to go to university and stuff I realized that yes fashion is something I'd like to do but I knew I had to get technical knowledge so I had to learn how to sew how to make a pattern and my parents are totally supportive on that matter. I, 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 let somebody love you. Let somebody touch you. My intention to um, flatter and you know enhance the female form. Celebrating the female form is my unique selling. You know that's that's what I'm the ethos of Koseba and that is what drives my designs and um, you know my design aesthetic.
I think the fact that I, I was brought up and grew up in Nigeria helped me because I'm used to seeing curvy, normal sized women and I'm very comfortable with it. So I'm not one of those designers that design for really thin people or if you're not stick thin with a flat chest, the dresses won't hang well. No, I actually, my work is best with a curvy person because the amount of figure enhancement that I achieve with my corsetry is more obvious with a fuller figured person. A person that is like maybe between size 10 to 12, people will just take it for granted she actually looks like that, not realizing it's my dress, but a bigger person, it's more obvious. And of course, everybody, regardless of size, wants to look and feel great. So that's what I help them to do. Baby, I can see you feeling kind of blue. Why you pushing love away when that's what you need? It's an everyday. That's the one in life who doesn't need love. Very early on, I decided I am going to do what makes me happy, what gives me the greatest uh, artistic satisfaction. I'm not going to go a direction because A or B says you have to do this, or after you got to this, you have to do that. No, I follow my path. It fulfills me and that is the way. So I just want to continue producing excellent, exquisite, well-made dresses for people that appreciate and, um, you know, uh, desire bespoke or couture work. I think media basically has contributed a lot. And then the, the, the involvement of blogging, Instagram and the rest of them has also internationalized the, the, the concept of African fashion. Now with the age of social media, email, Instagram, Facebook, it's easier to connect or introduce yourself to people that probably you would never meet, your paths would never cross under normal circumstances. But Instagram and Facebook make, enable that to happen in a, in a, what I call a soft way, you know. And that's how I actually interact with lots of young designers. I mean, I can't, promise that they can come to my studio and learn under me because that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm running a business and I have to, you know, that's my priority. But I'm always happy to, you know, pass on, you know, uh, any help or information that I can. Also, internationally, with all the fashion weeks, um, designers across the world have begun to look to Africa over the last 10 years for inspiration. So African fashion, I believe, is the next frontier. Hi there everybody, I'm Yemi Oshinkoya and you're watching R2 TV. When I started my business, it was during a recession in the UK. So I've never actually worked for anyone and I made a few mistakes when I started, which I feel people should do under somebody else's um, yeah, supervision. So I always tell people, try as much as possible to get work experience. You might feel, oh, you know, even if you're not being paid, it's invaluable. You know, it's invaluable, um, it's invaluable experience and you learn the reality of running a business. Because no matter how talented you are, if you don't run it as a business, you will, you will go bankrupt. It's not a question of breaking the mentality, really. It's a question of the fact that we have not managed to commoditize African fashion. Fashion across the world, they have managed to turn them into to turn it into a commodity. You, no matter what it is, even if it's couture, whatever it is, you can walk into any uh, shop, any show in uh, any shop in Europe, anywhere, and you, you you purchase whatever it is that you want. A lot of African designers are still doing couture, which basically means that um, you walk into a place and they make a unique outfit for you. Unique outfit is actually the reason why a lot of designers haven't um, been making loads of money yet and they haven't turned their designs and everything into commodities. You turn them into commodities so that you sell them at a very cheap rate, you sell the hundreds of thousands and millions of pieces across the world. We can't continue to, um, to, to do fashion the way we're doing it right now and depending on um, individual, uh, individual uh, uh, patronage and all that. What we need for designers to do is to turn their designs into apparels that you can walk into a shop and buy. Until we're able to do that, people will continue to, it's easier to get a shirt and a tie than to get an African outfit. That's the truth. So designers have to find a way to commoditize their designs for us to be able to make sure that 
like what you're wearing now. You can walk into any shop. You can walk into um, any any um, 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 shop anywhere and pick it up. Until that is done, if you're if you're designing it, there will always be special outfits. Then African designers do a lot of special outfits. They do one on one and all that. But it, it it pays for them because there are issues around that as well. But the reason why we can't wear our own outfit to the office every day is because most of them are not available as commodities. You can walk into the shop and buy them. The truth of the matter is, you, you, you come out with an outfit, you come out with a design. Now, if you want that special design tailor-made for you, which is couture, you pay a special premium for it. But then that is not where the money is because for, for, for God's sake, how many Nigerians can afford a 100,000 Naira outfit? How many Nigerians? You walk into any of these designers now. I know for so, some shops in, uh, in, in Lagos, you walk in there, uh, you see a skirt that is made with Ankara. Ankara, less than um, 100, 1,500 um, 1, Naira per six yards, and you're selling it for 130,000, 150,000. How many Nigerians can afford that? You're looking at celebrities, you're looking at politicians and the rest. Those are the people that patronize these designers that, that make couture. Now, the rest of us will always only aspire to wear those things. But not everybody should wear couture. That's the truth. I think because um, at the moment, most, even, most people are doing bespoke couture work, which in itself probably is inaccessible to sort of like the masses. And I think if Nigeria had the right infrastructure, for example, constant electricity, that is a problem because for somebody to invest in a factory that is going to produce um, lots of garments and you have to factor fuel and generators before you've made a penny, that is, that is a, you know, I think it's a, it's a deterrent. And also, I guess, um, with the uh, fabrics, you know, the fact that there are cheap uh, fabrics coming from um, the, like China and places like that. That, that uh, doesn't um, enhance the Nigerian textile market because it would be a great idea if you know, it could be incorporated. But I think it's going that way. People are realizing that you can actually make a lot of money with a sort of like a high street equivalent in Nigeria. I mean, that's not the direction I want to go, but I, I can, I can recognize the fact that that will be uh, a key. If somebody can actually do that and have like a Nigerian version of Topshop or um, Zara, that would be a great thing. Another way to go about it is once you have done all the designs that you're, 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 uh, you're once you've come up with your designs and you're making money in, in some way from the couture angle, you do a version of that the same design and you mass produce it across Africa. That's mass production, you must produce it across the world. That mass production is what gives you all the money that you make to be able to maintain your couture line. Imagine that you sell a million shirts at 1,000 Naira. Exactly, that's what we're talking about. Imagine that you, you come up with this design you're wearing now and you go to China and you mass produce it and you put it in all the shops across Nigeria. Somebody in Port Harcourt can walk into a shop, pick the same design, somebody in Lagos, somebody in Kano, somebody in Port Harcourt, somebody in, 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 in Ilorin, somebody in Jobok, somebody in Accra and all that. Before you know it, you are rolling in money. Somebody feel 
I would not put on any outfit that makes me look ridiculous just in, in the name of following fashion or following a trend and um, personally for me uh, clothes that don't that don't fit properly uh, I think that's a, a no-no come and get it don't be shy don't hold back let somebody hold your body let that somebody be me let's be gentle let's be wild let's do it gladly let us die in the kitchen and the bed on the floor and in the air call me girl and I'll be there you guarantee to scream who I got diamond in the rough you need to let your light shine all you need is good to love it I believe in strong branding and on social media it's best to have the same name and keep that. Now my name on all platforms is Yemi Kosiba and the Yemi is Y-E-M-I-K-O-S-I-B-A-H, all one word. So on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Yemi Kosiba and that's what I would advise most young people now because now is, I mean it's the best time to be a young designer because you can own your PR, you can own your, your marketing, you don't have to go via someone, it doesn't cost anything as long as you have a smartphone and you know how to use it properly, the, the options are endless, you know, with e-commerce and, you know, payment through PayPal, you can sell to uh, anywhere really, so it, it's an exciting time but people shouldn't, people should then know that you have to produce really um, excellent quality. You know, you can't just be a designer and produce rubbish, it's, it's not good enough.